Ah, oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental Tire from the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios. I am Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Matt Doyle, Kalen Carr. We were incoherent last night. Why? Oh, you know why. The U.S. triumphant in the all-important, ever-lusted-after CONCACAF Nations League final against uh, Mexico. 3-2, we did our thing last night. I think we got some of the bumps out of the way, so we're going to be very focused (laughs) in this show, guys. Do you feel the same way, or are you going to just regress? Doyle, how many hours did you sleep last night? Not enough. (laughs) Not enough. I I had trouble falling asleep. I crawled into bed around 2. I had trouble falling asleep, so I ended up jumping out of bed around 2.30 and and rewatching the game, and then I got up at 8 to write my column. Oh, my God. I was oh. I rewatched the game too. I rewatched the first half uh, over three fingers of the good stuff, and that was uh, both a good decision and a terrible decision. I should have watched the second half. Should have just yeah. waited for that part. The first half wasn't the part I wanted Doyle, to get to. But Doyle, when you rewatch matches, do you like do a live stream back of the Twitter timeline as well, just to kind of like get that full experience? No, no I, I like I am genuinely getting tired of the Twitter experience. Like, <laughs> I have to say, like I. I, I don't interact with a ton of different Twitter cadres, but um, U.S. men's national team Twitter is just the the dumbest, most poisonous <laughs> place on earth. <laughs> and I am I am I am like slowly unwinding that and like removing myself from it because there there are a lot of people who have no idea what they're seeing, and it's it's not even worth trying to talk to them. It's wild during this game. You're like I I open up Twitter and I'm like. Where did this person come from? Like, did, is this their first soccer game? Because it's like all these people, we're on there all the time. We're watching MLS every week. We're talking about stuff. And these people just drop in air, you know, just airplane out of nowhere. And it's like, whoa, oh, okay. I didn't realize you were an expert in a three-man <laughs> back line all of a sudden after covering the NFL for 25 years. <laughs> well, this was the great unifier, right? Like games like this, yeah. this brings it all together. Like people that you didn't know were U.S. soccer fans. People that you didn't know were soccer fans in general all of a sudden dropping in. It's like, wait, I thought this was our exclusive territory. It's not. Welcome. But also, we're going to judge some of those takes. I have stopped looking at soccer Twitter as much as possible when I watch games because it makes me like think I'm crazy, and I'm just like, do I do I not see what's happening? Can I not trust my own you know like opinions as it happens? Let's try to just dive into this thing. This show is going to be all U.S. Mexico. We have a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about a final, but you have to remember there's another game coming on Wednesday. USA Costa Rica is coming. Costa Rica finished fourth in these Nations League finals. They lost to Honduras in the third place game. That one's at 7 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. ESPN 2, Unimas, and Tuda in. It's the Daryl DK game in my brain. We'll see if that <laughs> holds true for Greg Berhalter. World Cup qualifying. For two weeks. He's never getting on the field. <laughs> Stop it. He, he is, is having the coolest fun, man. cheerleader in USMNT history. <laughs> He's just having fun. They score yeah. goals. They run to him. They have iconic <laughs> photographs. He's in the background. They celebrate with the trophy. He's there to get it and also have he, his medal. He also had a huge role to play. He ran security guard for Chiarena <laughs> while he was down after getting hit. And then to add a troll at the end, he did a little brush his shoulders off as like French fries came flying down on him. I thought you were going to say security guard for Kate Abdo and, uh, and Clint. <laughs> <laughs> he would have been better at it than <laughs> what went down. Yeah. What was that? Boy, wow. that, we have a lot to talk about here. We're going to go through what this one meant. Big picture, also in the the micro side of things, dig into what happened on the field through the tactics of Greg Berhalter. Was this the best U.S.-Mexico game of all time? It might have been the most absurd. We'll try to dig into that as well. Uh, There are insane moments to go through, whether it is, as you say, the CBS uh, set invader, I might say, or the referee taking center stage. I mean, this was like a WWE match. There were narratives and scripts and everything else. There were stoppages. There was a scuff PK spot. There was Kellen Acosta doing his absolute best to get all the way into Andres Guardado's head and succeeding in the end. There was Ethan Horvath having an emotional moment on the field, and I think his career is is in a little bit of a limbo as well. We'll talk about the number one spot for the U.S. goalkeepers, Christian Pulisic, invisible, then very visible, shushing crowds, scoring PKs, embedding himself in U.S. national team's fans' hearts, the number six, the five-man, four-man, whatever it was, back line, the number nine. There's just so much, plus all of your mail interspersed. And then a night of history, a night of firsts, First Nations League ever, first goal for Pulis against Mexico. I think the biggest moment was it was the first time, and I've checked the record books, I emailed Rick Laws, that a trophy presenter 
stanky legged on the field <laughs> as he presented the trophy. Our guy, Chuck. Oh, oh my God. I love that because he was kind of looking like, and they were like, is, is he actually going to do this? <laughs> and he's like, they don't know oh, yeah, he's going to do it. Yeah, they don't know yeah, Charlie at all. The answer with Charlie is that, yes, he's always going to do it. <laughs> Might yeah. as well give it a shot, man. Might as well give it a shot. Okay, let's start with this. Big picture. This felt good. It, it like It gave me a lot of life that has been, I think we all have felt, missing from national team fandom coverage for a long time. It's meaningful games. It is the beginning of something new. It's looking into the future and having hope as opposed to uncertainty and sometimes some darkness. I mean, we've been there. Um, Doyle, what, what did this game, this victory, this moment for this young team, and they are young, very young. We talked about the lineup uh, earlier in the in the uh, Nations against Honduras. It was the second youngest ever. This was like, I think, 24 years average, whereas Mexico was in the 28 range. Mm-hmm. What does this Nations League final triumph mean? The The poetic version is, oh, it's a turning of the page from this great Mexican generation that has really dominated the region over the past decade, basically since the 2011 Gold Cup final. Um, By the way, we got a little pushback on that. People want you to start saying 2014-15 because we won the Hex in 2014. We won the Gold Cup in 2013. Landon was still sort of around. I'm just telling you the mailbag. I'm just I'm just speaking for the people. That's okay. I, I mean, I, I'm willing to, to. It's not as poetic though. Decade you, is so much better. You can than, like, say seven the last years of dominance. You know, but I think like, you could yeah. say the last two cycles and the last generation. Fine, the last two cycles and the last generation. This this really superb generation of of Mexican talent. Um, you know, the the torch being passed to this younger generation of, of U.S. talent with, you know, players winning Champions Leagues and the French League and German Cups and. You know, Italian cup all on down the list. Um, it, that's the the sort of the big picture poetic. The the smaller picture, the thing that I'm more focused on, and I, I imagine Greg Berhalter and, and the team is more focused on, is that this was a massive step towards being mentally prepared for World Cup qualifying. And, and as fun as it was to watch this team beat Mexico and, and get the win, um, I I would have been okay if the result had gone differently by, by about the 70th minute, I was in like, I, all right, I, I get it with this group. They have met the moment in terms of the urgency required to play in and win these games. And with the baseline level of talent in this group, it, it almost doesn't matter what the tactics are. If they play that hard in world cup qualifying, they could play it, it could be a, a 263 it doesn't like they're 262 it doesn't matter what the formation is or high block or low block if they play with that level of urgency they will qualify for the world cup with ease and i didn't know that this group had that mentality in them and part of it is that we just haven't seen it before because they're so young and part of it is PTSD because of what happened in 2018. When if you go back and you watch that Kuva game, they just they played with zero urgency until it was too late. Um, and, and part of it is, and we talked about this on, on the pre and post game shows last night. Nobody on the field for this U.S. team is the man with their clubs. Like like Christian Pulisic is awesome. Weston McKenney is like is growing into that role for the U.S. But like it's not like as Chelsea, as Pulisic goes, so goes Chelsea. As McKenney goes, so goes – like they're not that type of player for their clubs. So they've never been in a situation where they are shouldering the responsibility for their team for 90 minutes or 120 in a game that matters. Didn't know that they could do that. The fact that they went out there and they did it against Mexico, a veteran Mexican team that has dominated the region for – seven years um that i mean that was a huge step towards easing a lot of the worries i have been harboring about this bunch and frankly a lot of the worries that were justified based upon their previous big experience with the u.s national team which was the 2019 gold cup can i just say that i actually think that the win does really matter 
Oh, for sure. That the moment that they had and that that getting over the hump and having that marquee victory, not just for the players, but for Greg Berhalter, translates to the Gold Cup, translates to World Cup qualifying, translates to these big moments where the expectation is they do just that. Like that getting over the line and doing it together and doing it in the face of all the, and we'll get to it, the absurdity that was happening around them. And also doing it in a way where like everybody stepped. Like if they had to have a play, almost everybody. If they had to have a play, if they had to have a moment, if they had to defend their teammate, if they had to feel um, uh, sort of uh, like, is this going, is, is Mexico going to win the mental battle moment? The U.S. always responded to those things, whether it was Mark McKenzie, 46 seconds in, we all drop our heads. And I know I was among them being like, oh my God, not this again. Are we going to, this is going to be it again? To respond to that, boom, to respond to the next goal, boom, to not like, give up and lay down and say, well, it's not our day, but we've shown well enough to believe that it will get better to just be like, no, we're going to, this is ours. Yeah. We're going to go shush the crowd. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to do it in a way where we look around at each other and say, when the, when it gets tough, there's no doubts. Like when we go to Honduras, when we have that game against Costa Rica or who or you know, whoever it is down the line, Jamaica and whoever gets through, maybe Canada, we are, we believe that we are alphas in the region and that we deserve to be at the top of the heap and we're going to go get the results that, that follow. And that's super macro. To me, it was like a lot of belief because belief has to sort of, in my opinion, has to be earned and implemented. Like you don't just start believing because you played pretty well. You start believing because you as a group did it and you did it together and you did it in a certain way with a certain attitude. And I, I think for this team, that's what it was all about. They're a young team that hadn't done it. Well, now they've done it. And now they believe they can do it. And with with young players, I think that belief is half the battle, right? So, and and, and the flip side of it is, I want to introduce the lack of belief into Mexico. <laughs> I want them to look at Tata and be like, I don't know, man. Maybe he's not the right guy. I don't know. Maybe our generation is too old. I don't know. Maybe center forward is a huge issue for us that we've got to sh- you know, like scramble and figure out. I want to introduce doubt into Mexico's mind, and I think that that happened last night too. So across the board, from just like a psychological perspective. I just feel like it was this big growing up chest puppy, puffing moment that the U.S. as a program needed because we haven't had that. Yeah, we yeah. we have kind of had our heads down just a little bit, and we've slowly been recovering from trauma. And I hope that this was sort of a flush moment of just like that's over. This is our team now. Let's go. Yeah. And Greg and said from after a- the game, I was just going to say one of his quotes was, "We need to learn how to win." And that's part of what we did to, to your point of there's a lot of great things that can happen. Winning isn't easy. Like that's a specific thing on top of playing well and doing the things you want to do. And that was one of the things Greg took away from it. Sorry, Kalen. No, no. Yeah, I was just going to say you go through the lineup and we'll go through some of the pieces that I think um, surprised and <laughs> stepped in in a big way as well. I think none bigger than Horvath. But when you when you go through the line and, and you say, all right, we're in a final and you're saying, who can I rely on in a final? And I think U.S. soccer fans, to your to your guys' point, was questioning, all right, well, you guys have done it in different circumstances, but we haven't seen it in a U.S. kit altogether. And if you go straight up the spine from the goalkeepers, because um, I'll add both of them, Horvath, uh, most especially coming in, and then John Anthony Brooks, I thought was immense in this game, even though Mark McKenzie and Tim Ream um, struggled kind of on either side of him. He really was able to hold down the fort and then um, – Weston McKinney, I think, was fantastic. I mean, there were just a couple moments where I, you can almost see he just has this kind of confidence about him that I wasn't even sure if, you know, I've seen him before and I, I know how good he is, but he has this confidence where he looks over to Burhalter a couple times and Greg's like, he almost looks over like, yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> And I'm like, do, do you have us? Like, <laughs> and then I'm like, oh no, he really does, you know. And like, he has this sense of belief about him and the way he plays. He was just all over the pitch all night and got the most important, uh, you know, on the on the header that you know, and then the other header and the other header, and then just tracking back everything, and then Gio Reyna as well, um, and then Christian who didn't even have the best match, but stepped up in you know the most important moment and when you look at him versus Guardado who stepped up in that moment um Christian I just love the way he even said like if I'm going for it like I mean he's like I'm putting it top bins or whatever term he used and it's like I just love that like because there's so much pressure there Champions League final winner uh Champions League winner and he's saying okay you know what 
you know, who cares? Like, I'm just, or I'm going to just go do it my way. And I just love that attitude kind of all the way through that from the big stars or the purported big stars on the team um, found those moments. We'll go through the other guys too. I thought were great, but um, through the spot, up the spine, right down the middle with our biggest players, I thought um, all stepped up in a big way. And can I just mention, so you said spine and we be to your point or Doyle's about changing generations. I look at this game and Memo Ochoa's 35, right? Hector Moreno's 33. Uh, Guardado didn't start in this game, started the last game at 35. Ache Ache in his prime, starting to exit it potentially at 33, 31, 32. Yeah. And then you flip over to the U.S. and you're just talking about youth up those spots. And that's where I see the change of the guard. It's not that there aren't great young Mexican players coming through, and Diego Linez was probably one of the bright spots for them. But the level of responsibility that the U.S. young players have and the future that the U.S. has, that's the big moment for me. And Liga MX is one of the top 10 leagues in the world. Mexico will always have talent. This will always be a competitive national team. These two sides will always go head to head. It hasn't totally been the case the last few years. We call it a rivalry. We say it is. We feel it is. But Mexico has been on top. And so that was one of those big moments for me in watching that and watching Weston McKinney just like laugh off Guardado and Jesus Gallardo at the end of that while they were playing with it in the corner like like starting to restart this rivalry and restart the future of it. We had the Miazga thing. But I don't, I don't want Matt Miazga leading my rivalries. I'll take Weston <laughs> McKinney and Christian Pulisic. I mean, you're, yeah, that's true. Like, this rivalry, this was like, you know, you get out the, you know, the thousand black cats and throw them in like a barrel and just light it off. Like, this is the start of something special. I cannot wait for the home and away and World Cup qualifying. I can't wait for how Mexico responds to this loss. Are we going to ignore that whatever metaphor thing that we just said? I don't know. I was just thinking of something insane, you know, <laughs> just like that pops cat. it off. You know, you're at 4th of July, everybody's hitting you with like the sparklers and then the uncle throws out the massive <laughs> string of black cats. I don't know. That's a very farm Kansas reference. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, it just... It, <laughs> It gets me excited. That was culturally insensitive of you, David. Yeah, it gets me. Yeah, I apologize to the res- people. In respect Fire Newton, country. Kansas. All right, Mound Ridge. All right, it's it's definitely a, it's a place, and people light off fireworks there. Okay, <laughs> um, but yeah, it just it gets me excited for first of all the Gold Cup, and we'll talk about that in a little bit because there's more to come and more folds to this to come, and slightly different teams, of course. But then World Cup qualifying and how this carries over. Like you think about all those iconic moments in the past, and maybe this is a good transition here into whether this was the best U.S. Mexico game of all time. Like those will continue on. Ache Ache choking Weston McKinney. And by God, he's been choked like every game he's played against Mexico. Even he noticed it. He's like, what's going on here? What, what's the deal? Like the red card that didn't happen, that should have happened mm-hmm. when Hector Herrera obviously just sized down Wea. The, the miss for Guardado and him falling to his knees and Horvath and the way it's reacted to in Mexico. The fact that the U.S. came back on him. There's just so many things that it's just going to keep going. And that bad blood is what made this thing so special for so long. Like, all these guys, you go back to, you know, trying to get there in the 80s, then getting there in the 90s and having a level of dominance. The yo-yo back and forth. Like, that's what gets... I am extremely excited to see these teams play. To see the U.S. play every other team in CONCACAF in games that matter at this level. Um, and we're finally here. And I, and I think that they showed a huge sort of uh, a growth moment of just like, we can do this. We now don't just believe. We have proof. Let's keep that ball rolling. Is this the best U.S.-Mexico game of all time? And should we just kind of embrace the insanity here and go through all the moments to try to measure it up? I mean, we had Kanchan hit us up and he said, well, they sit around the campfire at CONCACAF camp. You remember that one from way back in the day. And talking hushed tones about this game, you had – let's just kind of go through it here. You had – uh yeah, the referee going WWE off of VAR. You had Tata with he's coming in, he's putting his arms around the referee as he's literally watching the VAR replay and then getting a red card really? off of it. And then the PK being called. I mean, what an insane moment. Why would you ever put the VAR booth between these two benches? Why would you not, I guess, from an entertainment perspective? <laughs> uh yeah, the Kellen Acosta mind games with Guardado. You talk about Pulisic great. going top corner. He had to have been watching El Tree literally like stomping all over that penalty spot. It looked like a mud pit, and he was like, "Yeah, mud pit or not, top corner." Shh. <laughs> I mean, there were just what was the moment where you were like, "Man, this is this is this is unbelievable!" Like it was just sort of a crescendo where it just keeps getting louder and louder and louder and crazier and crazier and crazier and weirder and weirder. And at some point, you just throw up your hands and say, "U.S. Mexico." Uh, I mean, for me, it was Kellen Acosta, <laughs> by the way. Like, that was a man of the match performance. Just wouldn't leave Guardado alone. And then started a fight with That's another the part. player 
to make the PK take longer. And it's like, it's Guardado. He's doing it the whole time. I'm like, come on, dude. This guy has been here before. He's going to put this thing away. We all know he's going to put it away. And Kellen just wouldn't let it go and wouldn't give up. And it was like, when that finished, I was like, Kellen Acosta started for the U.S. national team until the day he retired. Like, <laughs> Emirates, like lifetime appointment for this starting spot <laughs> off that moment. By the way, it was a, it was a pretty good penalty. Like, is the it? save, I thought so, man. It had some pace. It was low. It was hard. I thought Horvath's save was incredible, especially given the time we're in where everybody is watching Zapruder style his feet. For him to have the technique to get down that fast, he's a big dude. And push, yeah. I don't it was know. more. I, I, it was, I don't think it. I don't think he took it super well, but I, I think it was more just the 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 weight of the moment and the fact that Horvath is was thrown into the match unexpected <laughs> and had done even if it wasn't even a you know even if he hadn't saved it you'd say what a performance from Horvath leading up to that um, and then you're going against a Mexican legend who comes off the bench is fresh like all everything was pointing against him but for some reason uh, Horvath he never he just never looked overawed until the game ended and then he sort of gets this sort of emotional uh moment going around where he just seems sort of shocked at what had happened um and then wanted to wash it down with the pepsi max um <laughs> get on him uh, <laughs> but, wait, wait, even, everything was bizarre like just even that at the end i was just like wow <laughs> where what is happening but i mean what a what an incredible performance from him i think we'll, we'll go into it a little bit more later but um yeah, that those were all huge. I thought also just not to get off track, but the Tata versus Greg uh, Burhalter thing is you know longstanding. We've followed it, of course, throughout um, MLS and these two teams going at it with Columbus and Atlanta, and then who gets the national team job, who is interested, who wasn't, who was out coaching who, and they had such. It had really interesting wrinkles throughout the match where Tata I think came out and said, "Let's press these guys. They're young and under the gun." And gets that early goal that. Um, where you know you're like, oh man, we we may be in for a long one here, and then Greg has to make a bunch of changes. Thought it was a smart move to kind of a courage a courageous move to get take out Dest um, and put in Wea at that point, and We've then been more courageous to leave Dest in with the way he was playing. <laughs> yeah, and then then you see um, Reem who's like alone on the left hand side there, and Tata's like. Hey, let's go get Linez. And within the first play, he like gets a meg off and almost creates a chance. And then the second one gets the goal. And then it's like, oh no, we got to switch. We take uh, Kellen Acosta, which is not a you know really a, an obvious choice to move to left back. They switch the formation a little bit, go to flat back four. It seemed like at that point. Um, so it was just all these little tactical wrinkles where each coach was trying to kind of go after the other. And then at the end, you kind of bank on your players to make some plays in extra time. I didn't think the Christian play was a penalty. I didn't think it was a handball either, <laughs> but they both get called and it comes down to which player is able to step up. But um, I, I, I enjoyed that sort of tactical in between the match between the managers and um, some mind games there as well, too. I'm, I'm sure now the pressure on the Mexican me- from the Mexican media is going to be huge on Tata, especially with him getting thrown out leading up. Um, what was the tactics from Tata? What, could, what do you think he was doing Going over to the official, touching the official. We know that that's going to be a red card. He sh- he knows that that's going to be a red card, or should. I mean, he does it in like a tender way, too. This is not an aggressive move, or at least it wasn't <laughs> outward looking in. Maybe he was saying some things that, that were aggressive, but like it was very tender from Tate. He's like, look, you have a tough moment here. I know in your league at home, you need- in Panama, you don't use video review every week. Let me tell you, that was not a PK. You, you called it on the field that way. Stick with your guns, my man. Like that yeah. That is... That is an iconic CONCACAF moment to me in, in the stoppage time, Tata Martino going over and having a, a heartfelt 1v1 that results in a red card and Greg Berhalter <laughs> ushering him away. Like, and that's just normal. It felt kind of normal in the moment. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. See you, Tata. Okay, that, don't do that. Yeah. Then he didn't want to leave the pitch. They had, yeah. to, they had to go back to get him. Um, <laughs> yeah, it didn't help his case uh, with the penalty. I, I don't know if that I, – I think – yeah, they, they might need to move. I, I think you hit a spot on with the the placement of the uh, of the video <laughs> review was just because then if Tata had come and put his arm around the ref if it was behind one of the goals, then it would have been an obvious red card. Yeah, well, he then then walked the, around the field to get the ref. I like, come steaming. Do out. you remember when I mean Printing. MLS was was you could listen in on the conversation at one point last season? Can you imagine if you could hear the conversation happening around <laughs> that congregation? That would have been amazing. Looks over his shoulder. I thought that was my fourth official. It absolutely wasn't. <laughs> Uh, where does this rank for you, Doyle, in U.S. Mexico's of all time? 
I, I think it's it's the second tier. The first tier all by itself is still the, the World Cup game um, just because of the stakes. There's nothing like a World Cup game. And then that, that second tier is uh, this game and I think the 2011 uh, Gold Cup final, uh, 2015 CONCACAF Cup, which was an incredible game. Um, and then, you know, there were a couple of meetings in the, in the 90s as well. In just in, in terms of, of, of craziness and openness, um, World Cup qualifiers tend not to be as open as this game was, which is not to say that this was super open and there were like chances galore. Um, yeah, but you got to put 2001 on there. The 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 one at, at the original Dos yeah, Cero. Clint gets yeah. hurt. Josh Wolf comes in. It's two degrees. It wasn't, it wasn't Clint who got hurt. Who got Clint, hurt? Uh, Clint had the pass. He had the three. Yeah. Points. Which is still the best pass in U.S. national team history. It was Jay Reina. Who got, coming for it. Yeah, right. Um, it was Reina who got hurt, and Classic. maybe McBride. Yeah, because McBride got elbowed right oh, in the face. Yeah. They broke his face that game. Yeah. Um, so it's. I mean, it, it's it's an it's unquestionably a classic, and I, yeah. I do think it is one that we will sit and 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 talk about and reference for at least the next decade. Um, I mean, the, a dude ran onto the field. Like we had, we had somebody invade the field, and it's not it, like the the tackle on him was absolutely amazing, and like <laughs> it's not even in the top fifteen of of crazy stuff that I, happened in the game. I mean, there might have been a guy who plummeted off the CBS set. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, I, we don't know what happened to this guy. Well, one, don't invade the pitch or a set, please, people. Like, come on, respect personal and private space. But like Clint I, Dempsey watched this dude go over an edge. We don't know what was on the other side of that edge. Clint, I have no way, idea. Clint, by the way, kept calm as usual, calm in big moments. Uh, I forgot until five minutes before we started recording this that uh, Araujo and Greg Berhalter physically yep. got not into an altercation, but Araujo's coming off the field, running after a ball. Greg tries to get it to play it back quickly, and Araujo pushes him, which would have been the biggest moment. If you remember, it happened with Pep and Ronaldo one time, and it's all anyone talks about for three weeks. And I forgot it happened because so much else went on after it. So uh, Burhalter, yeah. Burhalter is, is so active on the sideline Lo- in terms he of getting involved, like in terms of like trying to get the ball and get it to his players quick for quick throw-ins. Going to put like, a crease in those sneakers, though. You got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's another. There's another pair coming from from the <laughs> manufacturer. He knows. I mean, Clint Dempsey he, alone was, was was like you know with the sunglasses and all that. I mean, he's that was almost ammo like jacket. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was great. There was a lot to this. Now, look, uh, before we get into sort of the nitty gritty here, you, you do have to say, like, throwing things on the field is never acceptable, period. I know that I, I assume that the people that are listening to the show right now understand that we've talked about it before. Um, so, yeah, there's that. And then you also saw the the, the protocol in this one late as well. Um, CONCACAF, the Mexican Federation, a lot of folks trying to eliminate uh, this chant. We know, particularly in this month, and and look, every single day of the year, that it's it's just not something that should be happening anymore. And I hope they find a way to end it. But uh, I don't know that that we have any power over that, or that our words will make particularly a, a big difference there. So that must be said. But the entertainment factor in this game on the field very high. Scuffles per ninety, at a you know expected scuffles and even higher level. I mean, it, it was. <laughs> All of it really delivered. But in the end, it was Christian Pulisic that had this moment and this photo. And I just want to shout out, and I think we should shout out and say his name as, as often as possible because this is really art. Christian Marchena is the photographer that, that took the photo that you're seeing going around. And we talked about it a lot last night. Um, put this thing in the Louvre, the Met, wherever it is. Get me a, a print for the wall behind me. It's Pulisic shushing. It's Tim Weah. It's, it's Gio Reyna with, like, the classic, uh, like, what you mad about face it's daryl dk <laughs> with his tongue out it's the lighting it's the mood for us fans it is everything um and for christian pulisic this was a, a big moment because he was he was he pretty anonymous yeah. for christian, a long pulisic, time. christian pulisic was was the best creative force for mexico because every time he got on the ball he he was turning it over and giving mexico a chance to transition in the in the other direction and and i think that a lot of it was him taking too much on himself and and not sort of trusting his teammates and trusting the functionality of the way the team is set up and and you know trying to hit a, a grand slam home run on every swing um so 
I my hope is that after having this moment, um, which is an all timer of a moment, drawing the penalty, converting it ice cold, and then running to celebrate directly in front of a section of L Tree fans, um, like that was purposeful. Uh, now that he has that moment, hopefully we'll see you know, more of the the Christian Pulisic we saw in 2017, frankly, when he was amazing in qualifying and he wasn't trying to to beat six defenders off the dribble every time he was getting a touch on the ball. Um, And it was, I mean, I I don't know if poetic's the right word, um, but it was, it was, it, it was a huge, I got, I'll just say, it was a huge relief to see him come up with this because, uh, you know, this team is going to be good. Uh, there's a lot of talent. They don't have a chance to be great unless Christian Pulisic uh, starts playing better for the U.S. And now that he has this moment, uh, let, let's hope that that's the version of him that we'll see in World Cup qualifying, which, by the way, it's like 82 days away. And we are not going to see Christian Pulisic most likely in, in red, white, and blue until World Cup qualifying. We are Christian Pulisic peeing on a training field away from getting voodoo dolls now. We're, we're back <laughs> into our sweet spot. And I appreciated every moment about that. Does that mean in like 15 years he's going to be in commercials south of the border? He's oh, be like... I don't know, man. Don't, don't, don't curse him with that. But he might have enough retirement. Channels and Landon Donovan, though. That's, that's what you want. That's what it felt like to me. Yeah, that's what like like yeah. Landon could do whatever, right? He could disappear from games. People were upset what club he was playing for, whatever. And he stepped up in big moments, and he wanted in big moments. There was less kisses of knuckles and stuff, but that's sort of what it felt like. And and to step up and take that penalty, there's a half moment for me watching from the outside, which is the like, okay, does he want this because he believes in himself, or does he want this because he thinks he has to take it? Yeah. And I, we, had, we didn't have an answer to that question going into yesterday, to Doyle's point. He was playing the character of captain, and I'm going to be the leader. I'm going to put it all on myself. We had not seen the results. And after that moment, now we have. And I think you can tell it's natural, and he's being himself, not he's playing. Because I, th- I think Clint Dempsey and Gooch said it well before the Honduras game, talking about him being a leader, saying he's not vocal. Be a leader the way you lead. Don't lead the way you think you have to lead. He's a young guy. He's going to learn that over time. And I hope that this is that moment, as Doyle said, that really this, the switch clicks. Clicks switch for him, and then we move on. Switch flips. Switch flips. Thank you. I was just going to let it, you know, I have so many of those flubs. I was just letting it be silent. Just let it just <laughs> yeah, be silent. I had a bunch of black cats in a bag. And I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, you I got didn't, your drunk uncle and everybody else. I, I didn't know that those were fireworks. So I thought you were talking about real animals. And I was like, no, what Lord. Like, term is this? No, no. I see that, you know, look, in city limits, they have different rules. And they yeah, have we don't even, I don't know. I think fireworks are illegal in the exactly. state. Exactly. If, if I had access, yeah, I would have yeah, enough fireworks. Never hear fireworks in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, who earned the most energy. who are the most political capital in this game like with greg with the team internally with the fan base kaylin who comes out of this final and also you have to look back at the honduras match as well in a in a in the best position or maybe the most improved position as it relates to this squad outside of burhalter we could go burhalter i would say i would say craig i i, I feel like I feel like there's, you know, there were questions about was he like, was he too inflexible to not play out of the back at all times where he was so committed to the system. And I think we saw him adapt throughout the match. We saw the belief from the players, what they gave to him. And I thought he made some interesting choices where he knew his roster well, too, where Tim, Timothy Wea, for example, he wasn't a guy that was the first name coming off the bench. We've seen Brendan Aronson. We've seen other guys come in and play a little bit more over the last couple of games, but he came in for Dest, and I thought that was a great switch. I thought from Wea, it was, it was a pretty mature performance from him as far as being able to, you know, there was not a lot of tricks or flicks. That's not what the game really required. It was really about trying to take up space. He was pressuring. He was using his space to stretch the field when he could. I think he was keeping the ball and he was keeping it simple and he kept it moving and put a lot in. So I, I think just the right little moves that he made, even moving Acosta outside, the double pivot I thought worked uh, for the most part to protect the back line. The three back system wasn't working, but he shifted it. And that changed throughout the match. And then 
he just kind of kept showing faith in his players and you could just see them responding. Um, and even with like Weston, when he scored, you know, I know people make a lot of watching these kind of small moments where you celebrate, but he ran right to Greg. Yeah. And I do think that is something to, to see as far as how the group does respond to a manager. So, um, and, and just out, outside of that, he hadn't had a major win up until this point. Uh, I think we've had some good performances, some not so great performances. Uh, Clint Dempsey was critical of, you know, the Federation to say we should be tested against bigger ones. And I, I was worried a little bit that, especially early on in this match, did this match come a little too early for this group? And are they going to get kind of punched in the face and have to learn some tough lessons and then pick themselves back up for World Cup qualifiers? Well, um, that was a bit foolish because the group proved they were way further along than any of us had expected. And I think to learn lessons in a loss is one thing, but to learn it in a win is really good. So even for the players that didn't have the best performances individually, I feel like for them to be able to learn those lessons and not have them be the harshest of them and have it, you know, have to go home and sit on it um, for a long time uh, will, will help a lot. But I think for me, as far as silencing a lot of the critics, I know there's a lot of kind of, you know, you, you guys are on that Twitter, that Twitter life where people are still in the comments being like, what is Caleb's this guy? He's playing it. MLS players. <laughs> What's going on? And it's like, all right, well, yeah, I thought Kellen Acosta was fantastic. Um, and I thought he pulled at the right moves. I still think we have some questions. We'll go through number nine, left back. How do we, or what do we do with Dest? But um, still to be able to get the result in a desperate situation like this in a big match, big scale, um, it was fantastic. So I'm all in. So one of the things I was going to add to that is uh, taking it out of just this one game. And I agree that I think Greg Berhalter is the biggest winner from all of this. It wasn't a must win game, but a win changed the reality for him more than it would have for anyone else. Um, with Timothy Weah, about three years ago, he was getting starts. He was the young up and coming star and he was going to be the future of the attack alongside Pulisic. And then he went through a bit of a, a tough spell and Greg Berhalter has been very consistent and specific, at least publicly, about what he's asked for from Tim Weah. And one of the keys when bringing him back into this group for this tournament, he said the way he played with Leal, the work he did defensively, his understanding of what the game needs. Leal was the best defensive team in Europe. And uh, Tim Weah won a league title with them. And the way he talked through Tim Weah and has brought him along to have him effective and ready to play in those moments. And I think he's ready now to take on more of a role for this national team was like a good microcosm for me of what Greg Berhalter has been able to do with this group of being able to have that big picture, but also work with these guys individually to start to get them where they need to be. Because as a national team manager, you're not training these players, but the group is so young that there is a level of that need for him because these guys are doing different things than what they do in their club and they don't have veterans to lean on. So that was just one of those moments watching way of playing this game compared to what was it? The Bolivia and Ireland and France friendlies going into the 2018 world cup that obviously we weren't at. He was a completely different player for this team. And a lot of that's on him. Most of that's on him and what he's been able to do and the work at Lille. But I think some of it, you have to credit Greg Berhalter of how he's been able to help him along that way and keep him in this group and then have him effective and ready to play in a moment like that. Joel, how did you see the tactical evolution in this match from Greg? So Kalen's mentioned a couple times that it was a back five or a back three and, and then it switched to a back four. I want to give you um, Berhalter's words on that uh, because it, it was – a very different look to the point where I like there were moments, especially when they were defending mid block in the first half, that it looked like a four, four, two. And like, we haven't seen Berhalter use a four, four, two for a, a good long while. So here, here's what Berhalter said. Yeah, it was complicated. We started with a five in the back, but if you think about the shape, it was an adaptive shape. So anytime they went to build with two, we would move to press with two. Anytime they built with three, we would move to press with three. And then our wing backs fluctuated between Serginho being a left midfielder and a left wing back. And then Gio being a high winger or a right midfielder, basically. Um, that's different. That's really, really different. And, and you could see it throughout the shape. And I think it's... Why, like I was in multiple group chats where there were people like arguing with each other over what the actual shape was. Um, and, and, and like I went back and I watched it and I hadn't seen that quote. And I, I came out of my second rewatch being like, yeah, it was an off balance four four two with Dest kind of playing as an old fashioned left midfielder. And, you know, uh, 
Reem as a stay-at-home left back, and then the right side was a little different, and he had DeAndre Yedlin pinched inside to try to neutralize Tecatito Corona and keep him out of the midfield. Because when Tecatito gets inside, cutting in, um, he, he's just devastating, and he opens up all these attacking possibilities for for Mexico. So to, to Kalen's point about switching the formation in, in the second half, like – I like that didn't come until late in the game. Like like Waya came in for Dest, and that was like a like for like substitution. What the whole point of the way that Burhalter set the team up is against any good team, you, you're going to give up chances, and you just have to pick where those chances are going to come from. And the choice that Burhalter made was. We're going to keep Yedlin high and a little bit inside to keep Corona out of the middle. Choice number one. Choice number two is with Chucky Lozano playing as a false nine, Brooks is going to follow him into the midfield to make sure he can't get on the ball and turn. And that means the poison you're picking is Tim Ream is going to have to do some work in the channels against Oriol Antuna. And we are going to have to scramble at times to handle that. And I thought the U.S. did a really good job of scrambling. And if you go back and you, you watch the game, the only times the U.S. got gashed was off of turnovers, whether it was Mark McKenzie like literally giving the ball to, to Tecatito in the box or for the first 20, 25 minutes, Acosta and McKenney were a step slow in central midfield. Like the, the, the front three was doing a good job, or front two, however you want to call it, was doing a good job of getting pressure to the ball and forcing long balls. The center backs were doing a good job of winning those headers and knocking them down in good spots. Um, Acosta and McKenney were a step slow. And I think when it could have been 2 0, and then that was called back correctly, um, and then the U.S. went straight down the other end, you know, off a quick throw in and, and you know, got the equalizer, that was the moment that the game really, really changed. And it all started kind of making sense for the U S and the, like the underlying numbers bear it out. And I I do think if you go back and you, you watch this game, you will see that Mexico, I can't remember a time where they looked so ineffective turning their, their possession into actual dangerous penetration. So I, I, I think Burhalter kind of made the right choices, both in terms of the starting shape and game plan and what to try to take away. And then bringing Tyler Adams on going to the four, three, three. I mean, it, it, I said it on the, on the show last night, the post game, watching Tyler Adams play defense is like a religious experience. He, he is he's so, like a world-class counter presser. He is he amazing. The game so quickly and closes so quickly. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, it, and we've it, missed it is. Them. And his and his like, his IQ is just higher than the other guys that we've had playing defensive midfield, and that's not a, it's not a slight on Jackson Ewell or or Kellen Acosta, and Acosta in particular was was excellent last night, but Tyler Adams is a is a level above, and he raises he, he raises both the floor and the ceiling for this team because he snuffs out more attacks, which is you know something you always need to do against good teams. But he also, because of that, creates more transition opportunities. And that's when this team has a fully fit Tyler Adams, they're they're gonna be able to they're gonna be able to do some stuff. He's the yeah. linchman. He's the most irreplaceable piece in this team. I just want to add one thing, because I forgot about this. Um, but a friend texted me yesterday and when Greg Baralter got appointed to the U.S. national team. My friend who doesn't really watch MLS but likes the national team and watched Jeremy Tiger said, what should I think about this? And apparently what I said, and this was coming out of his time with Columbus, was, well, what I love about him is he knows his principles and he knows how he wants the game to play, but he's flexible. Because if you remember, that was kind of when we had gotten out of, he went long against the Red Bulls to beat Jesse. He adapted against TFC to to contend. They didn't win that series, but they were close. And that was one of the he things Tata in the playoffs and he beat Tata in the playoffs in his first playoff game. And I, I had forgotten that that was the thing. That was the first thing I said to him was like, yeah, you don't throw everything out the window for a big game, but you can adjust the things you do while having a team that still understands what your principles were. That's what Greg did yesterday. That's what he did really successfully with Columbus. And that was one of the things the U S had lacked for six or seven years before he got this job. And so that was exciting to see and for it to be successful was big.
Mr. Controversial on Twitter hit us up. Two set piece goals and a PK. No goals from the run of play. Largely outmatched in possession. I feel like last night's win was more about individual quality and not team tactics, identity, and progression. Am I wrong? I think you've yeah. kind of established that you think he is yeah. wrong. But on the on the side of like on, on chance creation. I mean, uh, on chance creation, the final ball wasn't there. Right. And this is like this, the second or third time in a row. I think there's been a lot of good play. And and, and like Reyna has three runners at the near post and, and he just overcooks the cross and doesn't find any of them. Or there was an early one where, where Sargent is alone at the back post making a good run and Reyna can't quite wrap his foot around the ball uh Pulisic getting into good spots and and sort of picking the wrong pass McKenney had one where he's charging maybe the best bit of interplay between Pulisic and, and McKenney in the entire game um I want to say right around the the hour mark it ends up you know Pulisic dropping deep and then turning I think it was Hector Moreno leaving him in the dust and playing to McKenney who, who's charging straight at goal with multiple options and and he decided to left foot it from from 22 yards instead of slipping someone in or or getting someone you know which into, still almost ended in a goal because yeah that and one memo spills and sergeant not an easy finish but doesn't get it in yeah so i like i i think that based upon the build-up patterns that i have seen from this team both in possession and you know transition moments I'm I'm not that I'm I'm not that worried. I I, I see a, a lot of uh, very good players getting into very good spots and not quite executing yet. Um, but I, I I trust that what I'm seeing is going to to translate at some point uh, to some very very high scoring performances. How about the goalkeeper position as we talk about capital? I mean, we don't know what happened to Zach Steffen. He did manage to hobble his way out there after this final whistle and celebrate with the team and celebrate with Ethan Horvath. And Horvath said, look, when I came on, we've been together since we were 14 with these national teams. Zach said, everybody trusts you. Just go do your thing. And he absolutely did. Does this, in your mind, Kalen, introduce a, a competition where there might not have been at least outwardly looking in? A competition? It seemed like it was Zach Steffen's job, period. Now, look, if he's hurt, that's one thing. We don't want him to be hurt. Nobody does. Um, I, I hope he's fine. I hope this is precautionary. I hope it's one of those things where he felt something and, uh, you know, he, he just had to come out because he didn't know. But should there be a, a larger conversation about who the number one in this player pool is and, and the decisions that Greg has to make come World Cup qualifying? I'm always okay with that type of conversation. Um, I think that that's, that's helpful. Um, and you want to have competition for places. And we've seen what happens even where I'm like, yeah, Tyler Adams is uh, unquestionably our best number six. Would I like to have a number six who stepped in in his place and was like, wow, is Tyler Adams still the guy? Like, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be a really nice problem to have. <laughs> I'd love to, that's I'd take a problem that. France has. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would take that at a, at a number of positions, but um, first of all, yeah, I don't know how serious the injury was. Not looked like a non-contact injury, which is troubling. Um, I still think, for me, Zach Steffen is the uh, number one pick for me, and a part of the reason for that is, look, I think he's a great shot stopper. He misread a chant. He misread a cross on a set piece in the Honduras match. For me, that's some a little bit of a rhythm play where you you kind of judge it wrong. Um, but I think also when you look at even at this match, his ability to come off his line, I think he has a little bit more range than Horvath. I haven't I've seen Horvath make some fantastic saves. He's you know, he's come off his line well. He took a couple in his face in the face against Switzerland, but those are a little bit more like uh short rushes where I've seen Zach command a little bit more, even when you watch him play with Man City, where he's able to really come off his box. Sometimes it, it might be a little bit scary, but that's part of the position for a modern goalkeeper, especially if the U.S. wants to play um, at times some of this pressing style that we've seen them employ against certain uh, teams. And then also when you look at the difference with his uh, with the ball at his feet, I think that's uh, a big mark for the way that Greg wants to play. Yes, we've gotten in trouble a couple times. Zach has found himself in some trouble as well as as you know some of our center backs, but. That's going to be a part of the way the U.S. wants to play, and so I, I still would back Zach as number one. But man, I love what I'm seeing from Horvath. I mean, the kid—he's like an instant U.S. soccer um, legend from just that performance last night. And yeah, if if I'm looking at potential injury or a World Cup qualifier or Zach's not ready to go, I mean, how good are you going to feel about 
looking at your quote unquote number two here and being saying, okay, yeah, he did it in this final. Um, you, you can go wherever you need to go. Um, we're going to feel good with you behind us in the back. May not also be even the number two. If Matt Turner has a good girl gold cup and gets in there, I would say for me, Zach Steffen came into this week as the clear starter. He leaves this week as the starter, but it's not as clear. And so I think he lost a little ground over the course of this week and other guys gained it. The problem is everyone has a hole with what they're doing, right? There is no clear, obvious player. Ethan Horvath plays great. He's only played four games this year. He may not have a club right now. So those question marks for him exist away from the national team. And for Matt Turner, we haven't seen him play with the national team that often. So he has to prove he can do that as well as there are question marks around where he'll be playing, which is not negative. It's a positive, but then he would also have to get wherever he goes and get time if he is going to leave the revs this summer or whenever it is. So I, I think Stefan, it felt like was in ink. And to me, now it's in pencil. He's the number one, but it's not as obvious and he doesn't have as strong a case. And then I'm going to get crayons out and start putting some other people in places. So that is a good point on Horvath. It's a point on Stefan. He said it on this podcast. Look, I have to sit down with my agent and figure out what comes next for me because he does want to be a number one. He does want to be the starter, uh, but he is he is in an incredible environment with City. Now, the same goes for Horvath. He does need to have games. Uh, you don't want to be going into qualifying, and you, you said it there, Kaylin, a little bit of rhythm. You don't want to have – those are moments that you can't afford in qualifying. That's just the way it goes. Like, those are the margins. I mean, if uh, Josh so Sargent we'll, doesn't clear that off the line, we may not have been in that game yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean so, – and we saw it in the FA Cup. You know. Yeah, and that's but that's part of the reason why a lot of a lot of these guys aren't coming back for the Gold Cup, right? Is so that they can sort right. out their club situations and they can get make sure they're in a position to try and get first team minutes or get regular minutes so they're prepared when World Cup qualifying starts. So you're you're sort of throwing everything at this one and then taking a break, letting other people emerge for Gold Cup, letting the European guys get settled into their teams because yeah, these are still young goalkeepers these are still young players for the most part across Europe and you know every over there managers switch every 20 minutes so you you know and you might be needing to find a new club so I, I think it's a it's a smart one and look if you're Horvath and you're trying to find maybe a move or you're trying to get a uh, like a place into a team you had a pretty good stage to do that last night so it's got to go well yeah congratulations to him as one crier to another Good to see you. Let it all out, big man. Good to see that. Uh, we talked about Kellen and Tyler. I, I want to talk about the center backs. We had one from Garrett Lucius here that says, with the performance from McKenzie last night that didn't inspire as much confidence, after Brooks, who's our best center back? Um, and I would I would argue one thing, and it's not a big argument, but like who are alphas within their club? John Brooks might be that guy, right? Mm -hmm. He might be the one where it's like, yeah, your team's performance is actually due in large part come down to you. And I think it's so encouraging to start seeing him that be that with the U.S., as well, but what happens now at center back? Like, do are we going to see more of this? I know that you know you kind of see the shift around and the formation and what the shape actually looks like. But you know, Tim Ream in space against attackers is not the most comforting thing <laughs> in the world. Uh, in fact, it's quite nerve wracking. So I just want to give a little shout out to Tim Ream for accepting the role of the sacrificial yeah. lamb. Like he was like, Greg Berhalter came up to him, probably told him, and he was like damn, it's going to be a really long day for me. But he accepted it and played it. I didn't think he was anywhere near as bad as people are making out. But obviously he he was... And Tuna he, and he Linez targeted. looked like they were begging for the ball. Like they were like, we have this guy every time we want to. But I mean, he did enough... Linez, Linez certainly, the fresh legs were... They made a difference. I, I will say that. And that was a good sub from Burhalter, though maybe two minutes too late. Who is the second best center back and how does this relate to the gold cup? You've talked about this a lot, Dave. Like if, as we go through this process, it was good to see. I actually think for everybody to get the win, Mark McKenzie maybe is the one that you're yeah, like, sure. thank you. Thank you. Because that, that can be like a confidence breaking moment. I think Mark is one of those guys that his head is squarely on his shoulders. He's super mature, but that's hard to, those are hard moments to come back from. For yeah, and I, I think I said on the show last night, I think, this morning, if you're Walker Zimmerman or Miles Robinson, you feel good because th there's an opening clearly for that spot. And I still, when you look at what Tim Ream had to do uh, and what the way he played, and at times Mark McKenzie as well, to me, I want guys who can cover ground and go out into those channels and make John Anthony Brooks' life easier, be able to cover for him or be the one who's attacking the ball for pressing higher and letting Brooks sit a little deeper and sort of allow the game to come to him. And you can see with Brooks in these games, he was phenomenal. Um, 
and he wants to be in possession. That's what he does best with Wolfsburg rather than being the one chasing Chiqui Lozano in, back into play. So I thought for those two, this is big. And then Chris Richards is the other one. I think in most people's minds, that was the ideal. Op- this was the ideal opportunity to let him start alongside Brooks in a format backline and prove that he's the guy for the next year or whatever it is while Aaron Long is out and maybe for the future after that. Obviously, he was injured. I don't think he'll be coming to Gold Cup. I wouldn't want him to. As you said about the goalkeepers, I feel that way about every player on this team. I'm excited for the Gold Cup. Every player's role should be make sure you are in the best club situation. Make sure that you are getting the most minutes you can going into the fall season in Europe. And so for any player there, that's the key and not coming to the Gold Cup and playing with this group. And so I don't know that we'll ever see Richards going into World Cup qualifying, which makes it questionable that you start him against Honduras you know, on the road in the second game of World Cup qualifying for the first time in his life. Yeah, I think the the one exception I would make for that that rule about like making sure that the European players are in the best club situation possible is with Chris Richards because we need to see him in a game like this. We we, we absolutely you have would to. bring him in what early or late and just I would, for a couple games. I would bring him in. I would bring him in for the whole Gold Cup. Like you if bring he's him gonna, for six weeks, if he is going to be the starting center back during World Cup qualifying, we need to see him start these games. We do. We need to see him against Costa Rica. We need to see him against Jamaica. We need to see him hopefully against Mexico again in two months. Um, and, yeah, it's him. It's Miles Robinson. It's it's Walker Zimmerman. And Mark McKenzie's still in the mix. Like, I I know people are crushing him, and I understand why, because he had a – it was a disaster class. But, it like – that's why you play these games I, so young players can I get felt through. He recovered them. from that moment though a little bit. I mean, he had a he, couple he, bad moments. He had a lot of bad moments, Weeby. Like he was, he was, he was pretty, pretty poor throughout. But like, uh, no, like nobody should be throwing him in the trash. Just like I don't think people should be throwing Jackson Ewell in the trash after two really bad games this past week. Like both these guys and and on down the list. There's like. Obviously, Serginio Dest was terrible last my, night, but obviously nobody should be getting rid of Serginio Dest after this. You play these tough games specifically so these young players can learn from them and improve. Um, and I, I trust that that is what we will see because we've seen it from a lot of these kids already over the past two and a half years. I don't think the three in the back formation worked well or five in the back or wherever you want to describe it. I just think what it inevitably, what it kind of relied on was even if you're going to play this sort of flexible system where you're having to cover, it requires really three very mobile center backs. And I think, especially when you look at the way Mexico played with Antuna, who, yes, he didn't score a goal or, you know, but he, he caused problems and they just kind of dump it over. And I think in some ways, some of this is a little bit of a misdirection. I don't know if we have the guns to play three solid center backs with Aaron Long being out. Um, I do think we can find two, but the question really becomes more for me a little bit about what to do with Serginio Dest. Because when he's played outside back in a four, it just hasn't, he hasn't looked sort of switched on defensively or even at times when he's had the ball. I think he want, you know he's he takes a knock and he wants to play and combine and he's he's brilliant at that but at times it looks like he he's looking for a foul when it's not there and he looks at the referee and the referee's like I don't know what club you play at like it, he's when the game has gotten tough I'm not sure he's been able to like switch on or really scrap or fight um and give you enough maybe going forward to justify what you have to do or if we have the pieces even to cover him um, in that spot. Now, Tyler Adams might be the best answer for that question for me because if you start Tyler, he can put out a lot of fires and he has that recognition and that switch to be able to really cover for Dest when he gets forward. So maybe that's actually the answer more than anything. But I, I feel like the two center back is probably still our best look. So, okay, um, just because it was started dragging guys, even Mark when he got dragged out wide, or when we looked at Brooks dragged wide, and it was just putting guys in a tough spot. And it looked a lot better when we switched to the flat back four for me. So, so um, let me just ask you this, because I agree with you. Now, I don't think Tim Ream and Matt Miazga are the guys to play in this system. Again, I think a Miles, a Walker, Chris Richards, those guys would look better in this setup. I the way I see it is. If I don't have two center backs that I 100% trust, 
I'd rather throw out three center backs I 70% trust to sort of cover for <laughs> oh, each other. How do you feel about that? Not great. I, feel, <laughs> I, I, I actually thought – um, I thought Mark and, and Brooks looked good at, as a pairing in the middle. But the problem was, was there were still these moments where Dest was getting forward and they were having to kind of like, they couldn't quite adjust and they were getting dragged out of that space. So I understand three was going to protect you, but even still, you could just find these little soft spots Mexico was finding over the top, looking in behind and just turning these guys around and saying, you want to go chase Antuna down, Tecatito? You want to chase him to the corner like that we'll we'll play that game all day Linez, we want to isolate you one-on-one and those wide spaces were where we were going to have some trouble um so I, I just think i'd rather pick my two and even from a continuity standpoint have two center backs that you believe in now i do believe that is an open competition maybe it's richards maybe it's zimmerman maybe it's you know wh- whoever it might be um but i i still I don't know. I'd love to be wrong and see the three work, but that three pairing clearly did not work. It, it just didn't have the mobility to get to uh, put out those fires in the in the wide spaces. Can I throw one last thing in, which is I would like to see Timothy Way actually start at wing back and play that role for him. It's not his natural spot, but it hasn't been for other guys who have played it for us as well. But the way he worked yesterday and then what he can do going forward, if if no one else is you know seizing that role, might not be a bad spot if this is a formation we play in the future. We hit one hour just now, and we haven't even talked <laughs> at all about the number nine position. We have a ton of stuff, in which the mail is good. On this one. We yeah, all I think need it is good. Some, we, yeah, take a know, step back. Take a step what, back. Our, RJ Hacks is coming out, and he's saying, "Look, I don't think Sargent's getting credit or getting noticed for the work he does put in, the positions he's in, the fact that the ball didn't either arrive at the right time or arrive at all." Vince Smith comes back and says he thinks Josh Sargent is ineffective against Honduras and Mexico. And then uh, Eldon Hasek is hitting us up and saying, is DK getting in the in that, that Costa Rica game? Do they owe this to him? He got a photo. He got a medal. It was Inzaghi-esque from him. Does it warrant a start against Costa Rica? What do you want to see against Costa Rica? How about that? Instead of belaboring the points we've already made about uh, the performances of Josh Sargent in the previous two matches, what, what would you like to see in Costa Rica from a center forward position? I've been wanting to see DK from the beginning. (laughs) Uh, I just think he brings something different. And yes, you know, Doyle made a good point about how the uh, first goal is created. It's just a long throw from um, Weston McKinney and Josh Sargent makes an alert run in behind, uh, tries to cut it back and it leads to a corner kick. And that goes in where McKinney gets the header and then Gio gets the goal. And that's one of those things that doesn't necessarily show up as an assist, but it's just an alert play. And he did a lot of dirty running and things like that. Um, I do th- wish we had a little bit more of a reference point of somebody that could just relieve some pressure, hold up the ball. Um, and it just looked like, it just looked like, you know, some of the balls were a little bit longer coming into Sargent, which was difficult as far as, you know, not having that quick layoff. And I, I think he is, especially around the top of the box. He did have some nice moments where he, he can combine and find places, but He still felt to me mostly like he was searching for the game or trying to catch up to the game a little bit more than making the game always. And maybe that's because of the amount of work and um, that he was doing to pressure and run and getting behind and stretch. But, you know, I I would I do think I would like to see another another. It's just like getting another opportunity. I thought it was going to be PFO just because in the last match, it was one of those where you just have some confidence and you have that ability where maybe you take an extra touch. You have a little more time than you think, or maybe you hold up the ball or you get a, you know, an ugly chance in the box. So I I would like to, I still have hopes for DK, um, but he hasn't gotten a chance yet. So maybe, maybe Wednesday's his day. And he's still smiling. I'm I'm just looking for goals. You're just like, can you imagine if he was in those set pieces, by the way? Weston McKinney yeah. won 18 headers. Daryl DK scored 10 <laughs> yeah, just, goals in 10 games yeah, on just, headers. Just oh, send, anyway. send Daryl in first, man. Let him clear the entire box, and Weston comes in behind. It's like an <laughs> escort. It, it is like Tata Martino. I, I'm sure you guys have, have taken a glance at, at some of the the Mexican newspapers and Spanish language papers in in the U.S. today. He's getting crushed. He is getting crushed, and I'm not sure that's entirely fair. Um, the, the one area in which he deserves to be crushed is his team set piece defense in yeah. going pure zonal, not recognizing the fact that there, there are only two 
there were only two good targets in that US 11, John Brooks and Weston McKenney. And they somehow still let Weston get, I think, four free run ups. That like two, one led to the first goal. Two of them were, were great saves from Memo. And then the fourth one was, was the second goal of the night. Like that was just a shocking lack of preparation and understanding of personnel because like Tim Ream and Mark McKenzie are, are center backs and they're both six feet tall, but they're non-threats on set pieces. I think the two of them combined have scored like two set piece goals in their entire careers. Like that, that the way it was set up, on, on restarts by Tata it was frankly negligent. I'm here for all of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about the, let's just take it wider. We all want to see DK and that's, that's a personal thing, but it's also a personnel thing. What else against Costa Rica could Greg tinker with that would make you happy? Personnel wise, tactics wise. Well, I'd love and- to see Eunice Musa play in a soccer game every once in a while. Doesn't seem like that's going to happen. Didn't get off the bench. I had a ton of questions Nations about League. that. Yeah. Yep. Um, just throwing it out there. Would have cap tied him. Didn't play him. That now waits a little bit longer. Uh, he's only eligible to play for 15 national teams. So, sure, that won't come back up. But I love watching him play soccer just in general. Um, and he clearly is a phenomenal part of what could be our future. And so it would be cool to see him, you know, get back on the field and get into that game. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I feel like a lot of people got opportunities. I'd like to see Timothy Wea get a start and get a couple minutes, more minutes for the team. Also, Brendan Aronson. I thought it was awesome against Switzerland. I thought he was a difference maker off the bench against Honduras. It's tough to see how he gets a starting spot, but a lot of the things that we've struggled with in moments are things he does well. The problem is the things everyone else does well maybe aren't his strong part. So it'll be interesting to see how he develops into this group over the next few years. Tyler may have gone longer than expected with the game going to extra yeah. time, so you have to be mindful of his minutes. But um, any chance we get to see Tyler suit up with the national team is is a good thing as far as trying to implement the system. And maybe we do go with more of Brendan Aronson and Tyler Adams, and we get a little more high energy and we see more of that press um, against Costa Rica and see if we can unbalance them that way. Um, but, yeah, Tyler Adams would probably be the first name I'm thinking about outside of who's the number nine to see uh, Man, on Wednesday. I, I just, I want it. I want them to shut Tyler Adams down and be like, go get <laughs> as much rest as you need. Put him like, in cryo freeze. You're right. <laughs> like we don't need to see, we don't need to see him against a, a, a pissed off Costa Rican team that did not play well <laughs> against Honduras and, and might be, uh, you know, lo- looking to get a little something or leave a mark. Uh, so for me, just talking about Francisco line. Calvo, right? Yeah, <laughs> not, not the rest of the team. Calvo was great. Calvo was fantastic. Well, Costa Rica He's Calvo. always fantastic for yeah, Costa Rica. Costa Rica Calvo is a different player, man. Um, I want to see the Aronson, DK, Wea front line. I want to see those three guys together because we are going to go into these three game World Cup windows, right? And that was the whole point of setting it up like this, where you know you're going to have to to rotate the team a ton. And we are going to have games where it's like we're saving Pulisic and Reyna and whoever are, are starting number nine is, though, at, you know, three months from now, that might very well be Daryl DK. So I want to see those three guys go out and have the burden and responsibility of creating chances and, and executing against, you know, one of the best teams in the uh, in the region. And the other thing is, like, this was an emotional game last night and you saw it on the players faces and you heard it afterwards in their quotes um how how are they going to bounce back from that against what is quote just a friendly but for these guys it's not just a friendly it is a chance to to establish where they are in the national team hierarchy and where they are in the pool so i like you know we started the show talking about urgency and and desire and energy and how that is the baseline that you have to hit. I want to see now if they could take that this game has stakes level of urgency and translate it to a game that kind of doesn't have actual stakes, but that the, the the fact that they play that way is just in their DNA. Now that is the biggest thing for me, no matter who's on the field. Uh, you know, what we didn't talk about, and I just, sort of came to me as I was thinking through this game and I was like, who was uh, impressive? Who did, who deserved, well, we didn't talk about Gio Reyna hardly at all in this. <laughs> 
he we gets talked his, about him a lot last night. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we gave yeah. him a lot of shine last night. 18 years old, his first goal against Mexico to have it in that moment to see his dad and his family who have an incredible soccer pedigree that doesn't have to be explained in this country up in the stands celebrating it. Uh, and to see him also sort of exert himself. And he's starting to do that more and more and more. And, and that's where you said, Dave, as you look at these two teams and you wonder about the future, some of them it feels like that future on l Tree's side, especially with their shining lights, is limited. Whereas on the U.S. side, there's this huge runway out in front of them. What did Gio Reyna show in this match? What does this mean for his role, his place, Fairly, come his on, ability to Gio impact Reyna games? Yeah. <laughs> <Well, I, I, laughs> I think over the last few games you see a lot um, because he he was much better than Christian was last night. I felt like he was the guy that you could go to in the attack and was going to consistently create something or get out of pressure. And then even um, defensively, he, he, he put a lot into it where it's like, okay, yeah, young, young player. He's got nifty feet around the box. He can find a good pass, but he put in a lot of work defensively where he's able to track back. There was a play, I believe where, um, I think it was uh, Linez or I think it was yeah, Linez. Came, yeah. Yeah. He came he and like, doubled with, with Reem and was able to win the ball off him. Yeah. Doubles down there on a couple of times. And then even there was another play, I think in the first half where he tries to find a splitting sort of advancing through ball um, into the middle of the field. He was out wide. It turns over. He immediately gets the, the ball back, kind of flicks it forward with the outside of his right foot, looks for it back, doesn't get it, but he's just so alert to, uh, to every play. Um, and he takes his first touch almost always aggressively going forward. So um, I, I just was such a big fan of his. I mean, even in the, when you look back to the other match, he almost, he, you know, if he scores that goal, it's a whole different game or as Doyle said, squares it. But I was happy with him. If you, if you, you know, cook two people in the box like that and you want to have a shot, <laughs> I say go for it. Um, and I think he's, he's got that in his game. Um, but yeah, he didn't put that one away. Um, but he gets a goal and an assist on this one. Thought he was... You know, he, he even when he gets kicked, he you know he gets up. He's he's ready for it. So he was really dependable in a big match, and I think in a way where even when Christian doesn't have maybe his best day, to know that you have Gio who can step up into his place or carry a lot on his own, um, I thought that was a really big, um, a big performance from him in a final and a young for a young guy. I mean, all these guys are young players, but. For U.S. men's national team, we've seen Christian quite a bit. He's got like 17 goals and 49 caps or something like that. Weston's been in the cycle before, Jonathan Brooks, a lot of the guys that we're leaning on. But I feel like um, Gio emerged for sure as like one of those top tier guys where, you, you you know, one of those guys is not in pencil, Goss, and you put him in pen. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I thought he had he had a fantastic game. I just got to, because obviously my role, obviously Gio Reyna, former NYCFC Academy player, NYCFC fans be pumped. Joe Arena, right now, U15 forward, the younger brother for NYCFC. And you can catch all that coming up on MLS Next at the end of the month. Guys Dude. like, you know, Weston McKinney, Brandon Aronson, they used to play in this. See the next generation. You see the FC Dallas uh, alum photo after this one? I mean, there were a lot of photos going around. Oh. As these guys celebrated. Reggie uh, Cannon, uh, another one. Red, yeah, it was Reggie. Brian Reynolds was in this uh, in this squad. Uh, obviously, you have Weston. Uh, and then I'm blanking on the the fourth member of that group. We probably just said him. But anyway, uh, a lot of connections there as well. And that's a good moment for us to sort of wrap this thing up. Uh, we're going to be back. This is the beginning of a long year, year plus in the March to 2022. Extra time, club and country, driven by Connell Tire. We will be doing what we did after both of these games in the Nations League, after every Gold Cup game, after every World Cup qualifier game. We'll be back here hitting the live button right after the whistle ends and trying to make sense of it with you. So uh, tune in. It'll be on MLS channels every single time. You can watch them on demand as well if you'd prefer to see Clint Dempsey wear sunglasses and yuck it up with Chuck and Gooch. Uh, I know we all enjoy that as well. But, um, yeah, this has been, I don't know, it's been a whirlwind like 12 hours, right? I didn't really know how to prepare for this game mentally. And then once it started, I didn't know how to deal with it. But then by the time it ended, by God, I felt like I was right back in the mix and, and felt uh, in uh, U.S.-Mexico form. And it was nice to get a win, too. Any final thoughts from you guys before we get out of here? You feel like we've we've covered the uh, the gamut here. Good to go. Let's get Doyle some sleep. I love yeah. that he was up like all night uh, re-watching the match. Yeah. I mean, I would say, but he, he probably does that anyway. So I'm just like, this was a good one to watch back. Yeah, it was. I highly recommend it. All right. With that, we're out of here. We'll see you on Thursday. Uh, Charlie will be back, so we'll get some good stories from the road. And we'll talk to you then. Enjoy your week, everybody.
So you made it through and even enjoyed more than an hour of MLS talk with extra time driven by Continental Tire. That means that you should go subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to them. And you should also check out more extra time on the MLS YouTube channel. If I can up, point right there, yeah, click right there and subscribe to the MLS channel right here. Have a great day, folks.